So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone from all around the globe. My name is Eric Mail, and I'll be helping moderate today's webinar on package compiler and static compilation in Julia. This webinar will provide a background on how to use packagecompiler.jl to cache the loading and compiled code of functions and packages, effectively removing the compilation overhead. You'll learn how to create executable programs that can be run without requiring a Julia installation or providing any source code. We'd like to have this interactive session today, so please write your questions in the chat and we'll either address them on the fly or address each question individually following the demonstration. With that said, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Christopher Carlson. Christopher is a software engineer at Julia Computing and a longtime contributor to the Julia language. He received his master's degree in applied mathematics from Chalmers University of Technology in Gothenburg, Sweden. Please welcome Christopher Carlson. Thank you very much, Eric, and welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, just to give a few words about myself, as Eric said, I'm a software engineer at Julia Computing, and I mostly work on the open source projects and the different types of tools that we have. So I'm involved in developing and maintaining Julia itself and also the various packages. So one example is the debugger stack we have and then of course package compiler but then many other packages as well. So to give a bit of an outline of the uh, presentation today, I'll start part one to talk a little bit about something we call latency and this and sys images. And this will mostly be a bit of a background sort of to uh, get into the real parts later, which is to create your own system images with package compiler and why you would wanna do that. And then the third part is about how to create these sort of what we call apps, which is just the uh, programs you can run that you've written in Julia without having the, the user you send the program to have uh, Julia installed. And then in the end, we'll have some Q and A, but uh, as Eric said, we'll also try to have this a bit interactive. So I have the chat on another screen here and I'll try to try to go a bit back and forth. But uh, if I miss a question uh, that you've written, I apologize and we will probably catch it later then in this uh, last part. So the first part one, part one then is about what we call the latency. So what is latency? Well, you can think of latency as the time spent waiting for work to actually start happening from when you start Julia. And here we exclude one time cost. Sort of, so if we can run some kind of caching procedure first to reduce this latency, that, that's okay. And the most common sources that introduce latency are uh, package load time is the first one. So I have an example here when I load plots and it took six seconds. So basically we're waiting for plots to load and that took six seconds and then we can start using it. So that's a source of latency. And the second common one is this function compilation or inference is what it's called. Uh, this happens the first time we call a function. So here I'm timing what it takes to plot something, just random stuff and also display it. And here it took about 12 seconds. But the second time I plot something, it's much, much faster. So we can see at the first time here, we had a quite big overhead. And this is also part of the total latency here. So if we look at the, the total latency, like the time to first plot from starting Julia until we actually see our first plot, it's in this case about 12 seconds for this function compilation and six seconds for loading it. So this would be approximately 80, 18 seconds of latency then. Uh, I also just want to say that uh, this was timed in Julia 1.5, but in the upcoming Julia 1.6, this has actually been quite significantly improved. So it's about two times faster. So that would be total latency of nine seconds. It's still a significant, but it's a good progress. So let's first look at uh, package loading then and some strategies for speeding that up. So first we have this package pre-compilation, and that is the first time you load a package, you do. Uh, do something called pre-compiling it. And that can take quite a bit of time here for plots, it took 105 seconds. But that means that the next time we load plot is gonna go much faster. And I also wanna show you now that in the upcoming 1.6 release, we have this parallel pre-compilation, which is pretty cool. So I'm gonna try a demo that shortly. Uh, so first I'm gonna remove all my old pre-compiled files. Just so I start from a clean slate, uh, since I'm gonna do 
Julia 1.6. I'm gonna uh, remove all the pre-compiled stuff from Julia 1.6. Uh, I start Julia 1.6 and then I'm gonna add plots. So I'm just gonna create a temporary environment and add plots in here. And it's gonna take a little while. And then uh, I'm gonna show off this uh, new parallel pre-compilation uh, support that's in 1.6. So something to look forward to. So here we can see we installed all the dependencies of plots and there's quite a bit of them. And uh, now we, have, we can do this pre-compile command in the package REPL, or we can also do PTD uh, using PTD, PTD pre-compile. And you can see here that um, we're actually now running a lot of these in parallel. So if I show, uh, let's see if I can move this window a bit. If I show the CPU usage here on my Mac, you can see that all the cores are, are fully working now. So if you have a very big project, then uh, this parallel pre-compilation can speed things up quite a bit. And you can see here the, the progress it takes and so on. So I think maybe this is one of the, the nicest features that I look forward to in, in Julia Open 6. So just wanted to take the time to show that off. Um, so this uh, 105 seconds is uh, without this parallel pre-compilation. If you're tired of waiting long for pre-compilation, this, this parallel one from 1.6 will be nice. Um, we can also turn off uh, pre-compilation and just load a package with, with pre-compilation disabled. So there's this flag to Julia that disables pre-compilation. And we can see then that uh, it takes significantly longer time to load plots than if we had it uh, pre-compiled, but it's shorter than if we need to pre-compile it. But in general, it's almost always worth uh, running with pre-compilation on, even though it takes a little bit extra time. As soon as you load the package a couple of times, you, you made that time back. Um, and this uh, pre-compilation, uh, the, the cache is great. It's tied to the specific version of the products package here and all its dependencies. So when you do a PKD update to update all your dependencies, you're gonna to have to do this uh, pre-compilation again. But all this happens automatically. I think it's recompiled when new versions are installed and so on. So you don't really have to, to think about it too much. Uh, just gonna look, see if there's any questions yet. Uh, there's a question here. I have a general question. How many scripts can someone compile into a single package? I have several interconnected scripts that I like to put in a single package. Thanks. I mean, there's uh, an answer to that is there's really no limit. Like the more code you have, it's gonna take a bit longer to load and so on, but uh, there's no upper limit there. Like there's very big packages and there's very small ones. And it's just more about uh, if the functionality sort of makes sense to have it in one package and then put it in one package. If it makes sense to have maybe a bit smaller ones, then put them in separate package, but it's not really about how many scripts you have. Okay. So uh, all of this package pre-compilation was uh, some strategies for speeding up package loading. Let's look a little bit about this first call latency then. So, uh, one way you can do it is to reduce optimization level. And that is that you're not running as many optimizations on the code as, as before. So Julia has these optimization level flags. So 0, 01, 02. And we can see if we run with 0, it's six seconds, 01, 8, and 02, which is a default pick 11. So um, reducing the optimization level is one way to reduce latency. and in one, after Julia 1.5, you can also set optimization level on specific modules. So if you have a package, which is quite, takes a long time to, to run its code in, but it doesn't actually gain much uh, advantage from high optimization level. For example, plots is one of those things. Running all these super optimization passes on the plots code, it's actually, it doesn't actually help it very much when it comes to runtime. It mostly just takes time. So in those cases, it might be worth uh, running with a lower optimization on the module itself. Um, and if you have code that just wanna start Julia and run something very quickly, that doesn't gain much from optimization, then you can also think about uh, turning on this O0 globally then. But you're gonna have to like weigh uh, latency versus uh, runtime. If you have a really hardcore numerical simulation, you probably don't wanna run with O0 because the, 
the time the simulation will run, uh, the optimization will pay for themselves at that point. So I was a question, are you consider adding a default optimization setting to different packages, like having cross default to lower optimization? Uh, well, I think maybe that's what I said before, that plots actually right now runs with a lower optimization level. If we, if we go to plots, uh, if we can see that they take a look at the, uh, Okay, for some reason it takes a very long time to well if you go into the plot source code you can see that they somewhere there they're setting the optimization level to i think 01 um, and another way of improving uh, first call latency is to prevent something called specialization and specialization means that Let's say you have a function in Julia, you can call that with many different types. The function is generic. And for each type you call the function with, we're gonna compile a specific version for that. So if you call it with an integer, you compile the one function, if you call it with a float, you get one function and so on. And if you uh, call a function with many different types, uh, that can take quite a long time to compile. And it's possible to put this, uh, let's see, no specialized macro in front of a variable to make it not specialized in that type. So then it's going to compile a generic version, a function that's going to work on any type you send in here. But of course, the runtime might be slower than because you can't generate a sufficient code when you don't know, when you're not generating for a specific type. And this is not frequently used, this no specialized actually. Like in Julia itself, it's used in some places where uh, these functions are called with many, many different types. But in, in normal package code, this is quite rare to actually use. So if we sum summarize these latency reductions that we have so far, we have, uh, we can cache the compilation. Somehow this pre-compilation stuff is a little bit along those lines. We can compile less code using this uh, no specialized, or we can optimize less uh, using these, uh, these optimization flags. So if you wanna sort of do a tally here and evaluate these latency reduction strategies, we can look at package pre-compilation. Now, even with package compilation, as you saw for plots, the loading time can still be quite significant, but it's kind of automatic. It happens by itself. We don't need to do anything manually. It just pre-compiles whatever it needs to. So that's a good thing about it. You can also lower the optimization level or use no specialized. Now this can impact runtime and the latency, even with these things, the latency can still be quite high. But a lot of functions, they don't really benefit that much from having this high optimization level. So in those cases, it's basically lower latency for free. So. And improving latency is a high priority. Uh, here a link here, let's see if my internet works better now, yeah. So here are the, different issues and pull requests on the Julia repository, which has the latency label. And you can see there's quite a lot of them. There's 36 open, 165 closed. So it's a constant uh, constant work in progress to reduce all these uh, numbers I, I showed you. Um, but even with this package pre-compilation and all this stuff, it's these type of strategies will likely never make it sort of instantaneous to start Julia and make a plot right now. What I showed here on 1.5, it was, uh, I think it was, was it 18 seconds total time and in 1.69 seconds. And then with another 2x improvement to 4.5, but we're still kind of far away where you feel that it's kind of like instant, which is sort of where we want to be. So for that, we might have to look at some different ways of doing things. So uh, Julia comes with a set of these called standard libraries. So if I click here, go to the Julia source code and all of these are different standard libraries. So maybe you recognize some of them like the date standard library or linear algebra, common one and so on, the, the profiling. And, um, and these are structured like normal packages. Uh, if you go in there in the source code and see they're, they're kind of like normal packages, but however, they, they load very, very fast. If you look at, time it takes to load the package manager, it's pretty much instant. 
And the package manager is it's a kind of complex package. It's not the most trivial one, and still it loads this fast if we compare to plots, which was like uh, six seconds or something. So a natural question then is how, how can package manager load so fast? And why can't we just do the same for, for our own packages? Like if I want to load, um, if I want to load um, uh, plots very fast, for example. So that introduces the concept of a sys image. And you can sort of think about a sys image as a Julia session that has been serialized to a file. So here on my Mac, I have Julia installed in, in this directory. And if I go in this libjulia subfolder and look at this sys.dilib, there's this kind of big 550 megabyte lying there, which is a shared library. And that is uh, the sys image that comes with uh, Julia 1.5 by default. And this one includes loaded packages and compiled code as well. So when the sys image is created, I have a link to the source code where that happens. All these standard libraries are included. And then when the sys image gets created, all the standard libraries get sort of put into the sys image. And if we just measure the time it takes to start Julia, just Julia uh, with the eval, the empty string. But here on the system, it was about 0 0.14 seconds. So if you think about all the standard libraries that had to be sort of loaded from the sys image, it's still very fast compared to how long it time to, to it took to load plots, for example. So just as a, a demo, I have a sys image that doesn't include the standard libraries here in them. So I'm just gonna make sure it's gone. So what I can do is with this sys image flag, I can start up with my custom sys image. And I have made one here that doesn't include any of the standard libraries in it. So uh, when you start uh, Julia, it automatically loads something called interactive utils. And since it didn't have the standard libraries in the sys image, I actually had to go and pre-compile it. And if you can see here, this repo, it's actually a worse version of the Julia repo because we don't have access to the repo now because it's, uh, it's not in the system. So this is a very uh, simple version of it. So for example, the arrow keys don't work if I do up or down, so on. And let's say if I wanna load the package manager from this, uh, this version of Julia with the no standard libraries uh, system. Well, then I have to pre-compile the package manager just like a, a normal package and that takes quite a bit of time it takes uh, here. I measured it earlier, it took about 20 seconds. So if we wait for the package manager to get recompiled, then I can uh, restart Julia again and then load the, uh, the package manager. And then we can measure how long time it takes to, to, to load the, the package manager when we don't have it in the system image. So it's still pretty quick, but it's nowhere near as quick as it was when, when we had it in the system image, right? Uh, and if we look at the disk size of the no standard library system, which is only 55 megabyte compared to the earlier, the one that comes with which is 151 megabyte. So basically what we can say is that inside the system image, we can store packages, we can store compiled code to make things significantly faster to load. So that was about how long time it took to load the package, but how about this first call latency? Does the system image help with that? Bit? And if we look at the default system, which I, I won't demo this now, but the, I just timed what the status output of the package man it takes in the default system image, and then it's, it's pretty fast. But if you use a custom system image that didn't have these standard libraries baked in, uh, it takes almost two seconds here when there's a large, large uh, ratio between these two. So the sys image also helps with first call latency and how, how does it do that? Uh, clearly it needs to have stuff. The reason why this is slower here is because it has to compile a lot of code to run this. So clearly here then it needs to already have compiled code available. So how does it do that? Well, uh, in Julia, if we have a method, for example, do something that takes some variable x, 
as I said before, we usually specialize those on the argument types. So if we call do something with a float, we're going to compile a specific version of that function for float. And if we then call it with an integer, it's going to compile one for integers. So in order to sort of cache these compiled code, we need to know what types to compile these functions for. So how would we do that? Well, one idea is sort of if we record what functions are compiled for what I call a representative workload. So a representative workload in the package manager might be that you load the package manager, you add a package, you run the status, and you do a few things that would be, be normal to use. And then you sort of record all the functions you, you run with that. And that's a little bit similar to this thing called PGO, which is profile guided optimization, and which is when you, you compile your code uh, and then uh, you run a representative workload and then you compile the code again using the uh, information you had from this, uh, this sort of sampled one. And uh, you can look at in, in Julia here, we actually, when Julia is built, it actually starts a little REPL and then it starts to print a few things. It evaluates two plus two, it prints, it calls some different things here. And all of this is just to, record uh, sort of a representative REPL usage. And then all of the functions that we compiled here gets uh, traced, and then we can compile all of those and put them in the system image for later use. And the same with PKG also has one of these um, sort of uh, sample runs that it uh, runs when Julia is built. So if we then want to trace what gets compiled and all the different methods and their types and so on, uh, I can show you, I have a little example compiled script, very small, it has a function that does some math. And then we call this with um, first an integer and then uh, a float and then a matrix here. So this is what I mean, the F here is a generic function. It can do this mathematical expression on many different types, even on matrices. And then if we call with uh, Julia with this trace compile flag, and if I want, I can output the results of it to the standard error. So I think have that. And let's do that. And then I run my example compile file. So now it's gonna print all the different functions it compiled when it ran this file. So here we can see it compiled this F for integers for float. And then it also compiled F for matrices. And then it also had to compile some other various things here. And uh, so this sort of gives us a, a recording of what the, the script actually ran. And if we want, we can also redirect this to a file. If I write the standard error here, it's, it's special. It's going to write the standard error. But if I just give another name, it's going to write to a file. And uh, can also trace the compilation when we start up uh, Julia. So if I just do like this, this is when we start Julia. We can see that we compile a little bit actually when we start Julia, but not that much. And I also have a version of a sys image where uh, none of these uh, uh, functions are pre-recorded. Like before I showed you in the REPL that uh, it runs some code to record the uh, things it want to compile, but I also have a sys image where it doesn't record that. So you can look at what, how much we would have to compile if we didn't do this pre-recording. Um, no pre So you can see it has to compile a way, way much more now. So all of these stuff that it printed here but didn't print before are uh, inside the system, system image. So if we sort of have a bit of a conclusion here, an idea for a tool to help with latency, we know that deserializing this type of system images is pretty fast. So if we can give this tool a list of packages to put into a custom system image, it's kind of similar to how the standard libraries are put in there. Uh, and then we also give a representative workload to figure out all the types we want to compile specializations of generic methods on. Then we start Julia with this new custom system image that we created. 
And then if we put all of this inside of like a nice, nice API, that could be uh, a way to profit. That could be a way to, to uh, not solve things, but it could be a tool to assist with it. Um, so that sort of leads into part two and how we create systems with package compiler. And package compiler is one part of it is kind of this tool I outlined here in, in the package. Uh, I'll also look at the questions. Um, there's one question where it says that it's not important to start up immediately because most tasks for Julia are computing intensive. Yeah, that's very true that uh, a lot of Julia is used for a lot of computing intensive stuff, but it's also being used quite a lot to, or more and more, I would say, to write just small tools for, for example, um, like some argument parsing, to command line parsing tool and so on, because Julia is just a, a nice language to write things in. And then you, this, if you have a long latency, that, that this uh, can be a little bit annoying. So for some things, uh, latency is no problem at all, but for some types of code, it's, uh, it's uh, good to reduce it. Uh, and then there's another question. If, if I give the types and function definitions, then uh, there's no need to do a representative workload. In theory, no, but um, we don't actually know if that function will be called or not. So right now, you would, even though if you have specified those things, you would right now still have to have it in your workload. But uh, you can of course think about some kind of other mode of compilation where we look through all the code for everything that has strict types and then you can just compile those because you, you see them. Uh, okay. So uh, package compiler then, it's a normal Julia package. You just do add it with the package manager and load it. And then, uh, one function it provides is this create sysimage. And it does exactly this, that you give it a, a package in, in the list here. I here I only gave plots because I only wanted that one. And then it's gonna take quite a bit and it's gonna create a custom sysimage for you. Uh, and now uh, this plots have been included inside that sysimage. So if I... Um, so if I load uh, Julia with this custom sys image now and I time how long it takes to load plots, you can see now it's sort of the same as it was with the, with the package manager. It's pretty much instant. And that's because the plots now is inside the sys image and it's really fast to load from there. And uh, it actually turns out that the time to first plot is also slightly faster, but it's still not, not instant at all. So that, that is one way where you know, we make a custom system image with the package we want and we can load really quickly. So now we also wanna improve this uh, first call latency. So we create this representative workload. Here uh, it's very simple. I just have one plot command uh, and then I also wanna display it. And now I call the same function, but I also add a second argument, which is one of these pre-compiled execution file. And then I give uh, this one as, as the argument. That now it also creates a new system image and it takes a bit longer time now because it has to, has to execute this representative workload. But uh, it's gonna be much faster to, to actually run it the first time. So just copy paste this. So loading is uh, fast now, and you can see how the time it takes to plot something. And you can see there that the plotting was, oh, here's the plot. The plotting was really quick as well this time. So uh, if we do a little bit of an evaluation then of custom system image, uh, we can have this fast package load time. We saw plots loaded pretty much instantly. And we can also have a pretty low first call latency if we have one of these sort of training scripts, if you wish, one of these representative workloads. Uh, some drawbacks to it is that it's sort of, when you're using the normal system, which you can just uh, add packages and remove them and update them and so on. But when you put the, these uh, packages inside the system, they're sort of frozen at the version they were when they got put in. 
So uh, if you create a system which with a lot of uh, packages, uh, you can't really update them. Uh, you kind of have to make a new system. But most of the time, you just install the packages you want, and then you use them for a while. And if you need to update, well, then you can just create a new system. Uh, it's a bit slower to generate one of these systems compared to normal package precompilation. And it's also not really automatic right now. You have to explicitly load the system image, or you have to replace the default one. And actually, replacing the default one is pretty a bad idea. You shouldn't really do that. So you should somehow uh, explicitly load the, the created system image. Uh, but uh, this is suitable to use if uh, the load time and the first call latency is long enough to be kind of annoying. Uh, and it's also you, uh, suitable if you're not likely to frequently change the packages inside the system image. So I just put some sort of suggestions where you could put this uh, revise. I don't know if anyone has used that. That's a very good tool, but it's something that you might want to load every time you start Julia. Oh, my rep ball is another thing that puts some, changes some things with the, the rep ball. Uh, it has a bit of a startup cost and you kind of want to load it every time you start Julia. So that's just a good one. The debugger is pretty good to put in there. Uh, plots, if you do a lot of plotting, you can put uh, that in the CC image. Uh, so yeah, before going into part three, then I want to look a little bit on, see if we have some questions. Uh, someone is uh, asking me if I can send this code. So yeah, I'll, I'll, in the end, there will be a link to the, uh, to the presentation. And also if you go to the package from pilot.jl repository, there's documentation there that kind of shows you, guides you through sort of what I'm saying here. Uh, another question is if when I use this precompiled system, which we must move all our code into packages. I would say pretty much uh, yes. The way it's structured right now, it works best with packages. But you know, a package in Julia is pretty simple to make. You just have to to make a folder and uh, with the, the module in it and the project file and so on. So uh, yeah, I would I would encourage uh, just using package for it. Uh, is another question is if starting Julia with this new system is disabled the default system with the standard libraries or both used now? Uh, it kind of disables it. If you choose to load another system, which is only going to load that one, and then the, the default one that comes with Julia is not loaded at all. So um, you can sort of pick which one you want to use. There's an uh, optimization flag is used to pre during precompile to create the sys image automatically O3. Uh, I am not sure actually, I have to look that up. I think it's O3 for Julia, but I am not sure. It should be though, because you want to have the best performance in Julia and the time it takes to compile Julia itself, not that important. Um, And then this is the new documentation on using package compiler with custom modules. I'm not sure what custom modules mean. Maybe that means custom packages. I said you had a hard time with it. Uh, if you have any problems, you can feel free to open an issue on the repository, perhaps, or send an email to me, and we can uh, look at it if there's any problem. I think quite a lot of people use it, so I think it should be quite useful. Uh, another question, if my precompile script uses distributed tasks, does code execute new workers also go into the system image? Uh, no, that is one issue right now, that if you're using distributed, uh, then if you run code on other nodes, uh, they won't have this trace uh, compile flag on them, so they will not do recording. So right now, you would have to record the stuff you do in, in the same process. So let's move on to part three then, which is creating these sort of apps. So one way you can sort of, with an app, I mean sort of like a software which sort of uh, is just used by itself. You know, in the Julia package, you can use a bunch of packages together and so on. Here with an app, I just mean some piece of software that you run on its own sort of as an isolated piece of code. And uh, one way you can do this with Julia is of course you can, uh, you can just install Julia, we can use Git or the package manager to download some kind of package or an app. Inside the package, you can have this uh, manifest file, which records the version of all dependencies. You start Julia and load the, this package or the app, and you can run some function in that sort of starts it. So it's a bit of a demo of one of this, is this uh, redux.jl app uh, in Julia, it's made by, by this person. 
if I go back to my terminal here and I go to redux app, start Julia here, and then I can start this uh, Redux app, for example. Oh, now I have to pre-compile it as well. It might take a little while. So while that become, is pre-compiling, I can uh, speak on a bit. So uh, right now I, I can launch this uh, app from Julia and so on. And it would be nice if we could just sort of ship an executable without requiring a, a Julia install itself. So we could just, oh, there, it, there it went. So here's the, the Redux app. And so it's a, just a, a toy thing with a GUI that has some kind of a to-do list. So, uh, you know, what do I need to be done? Uh, by the groceries, by the and uh, take out the car, the garbage. And then I can mark these things when I've done them, and I can clear complete it. I can see this one. So it's just a little toy thing just to show you have something to look at. Um, so now I started this from Julia, but it would be nice to just do an executable instead. So if we think about how Julia itself is shipped, uh, Julia has the runtime libraries that it needs. It has various other libraries. For example, it has LLVM for compilation, JIT compilation. It has open laws with it for different uh, linear, linear algebra uh, operations. It has libgit2 to do different Git things, which is needed by the package manager. It comes with the sysimage that has a bunch of pre-baked packages and compiled code. And then it also has an executable that initiates, initializes Julia and kicks off a Julia function starting the repo. So that's what happens when, when you know, we start Julia, we start an executable, it loads the sysimage, it calls a function that starts the Julia repo. So a possible idea for creating apps then is the following. We use a custom sysimage that has our own packages and compiled code, like I showed before, uh, to improve the latency. We bundle the Julia runtime libraries. We make our own executable with sort of a custom entry point starting up our app. So instead of starting up the repo, I go back, I can still in instead start this uh, Julia main here. So we just start the app straight away. Um, and this also means that there's no need to bundle any source code because everything is stored inside the, the system. So all the textual source code doesn't have to be co uh, go with it. And we're using normal packages. We also get the, all the source code. So the way you create an app with package compiler is that you give it some, some input folders. So here I gave, gave this Redux app that I showed before. We give it an output uh, folder, so your Redux app compile. And in the same way, you give it an execution file. So it's sort of a representative workload so we can record the different uh, signatures that's going to be needed. And this, this will create a, a sysimage with this app package and all the dependencies in it. It will bundle the Julia libraries. It will also bundle artifacts. So artifacts is libraries that packages use. So here, uh, there's, a, there's a library called CMGUI, which is what showed the graphical user interface that came up there when I had the to-do list. And it also creates an executable that runs this uh, Julia main defined in the package. So, so uh, if I go into the Redux app compile then now, we can see here that we have uh, sort of a little bit like a, a Unix system and we have a bin folder. You can see inside there, we have a, an executable and a sysimage. We have a lib folder. And inside here, we have the Julia uh, runtime libraries and so on. And if we go into artifacts, these are just uh, named like this, but here are all the libraries that the app itself would need. So for example, the C ingrid. 
And now we should be able to just run uh, bin and this executable here. And here uh, I have exactly the same thing as I showed before, but now it's not actually using any of my local Julia install. Everything that it needs uh, is uh, is inside this this folder here. So in theory, you could just like zip this up and send it to someone else, and they could run it. So. Uh, the total size then of this app, if we look at it, is actually quite big. It's 290 megabytes. If we compress it, it's 80 megabytes. So 95, if you just do a bit of a size breakdown, 95 megabytes uh, is from the SCC image. And here's actually smaller than the default SCC image because we don't need all the standard libraries inside the, the custom SCC image that we created. Uh, 65 megabyte is uh, actually open blows, and here we don't actually need open blows, so uh, it's a bit of a to do now for package compiler to figure out what libraries you actually uh, need uh, for the app so we can reduce the size a bit. Uh, lib LLVM is 44 megabytes, and maybe if we can ensure that we don't need any JIT, we could maybe not bundle it uh, in theory. Uh, we'll see how, how hard it is to exclude this one in, in practice. And 12 megabytes were uh, artifacts, and those uh, are needed for the library to uh, to actually run. So those we have to have to put in there. Uh, I'm just going to look at the question a bit. Um, where wouldn't you recommend using package compiler? Well, I would say if you're frequently updating packages, if you're uh, sort of we're doing interactive work where you have to change packages a lot and so on. Uh, then I wouldn't use it. But if you're working sort of with the same dependencies for a long time uh, and loading those takes a bit of while, then it might make sense to try use the custom system image with those dependencies and then uh, you can load those a bit faster. Um, let's see here. Is the generator system image independent of the operating system? Can we share an app that maybe from Linux Windows would need to recompile? You will need to uh, recompile. Uh, it, uh, if you if you run a uh, package compiler on Windows, you will get the shared library that or DLL then, which will only be valid for Windows. Uh, so yeah, you're gonna have to compile it for the different operating systems. Um, or only really you. Uh, are only really use are only really artifacts used. Like is the libg2 standard lib and dll included when the app is not calling it? Uh, so we can go into the to the go into the lib here. We're going to Julia, and we can see all the libraries that we sort of package into the the app here. We can see that we do have. We're probably going to have libg somewhere here yeah here so even though we didn't you probably use libgit in the app we still with the version of package compiler just now it just bundles everything because there's no good way to figure out if you're going to use libgit but there's actually work in progress for this to make it more declarative which of the libraries you use and so we should be able to get rid of the stuff that's not needed uh, does the compiler require me to specify the target architecture? That is a good question. So I can show you in, if we go to the package compiler repository, and then we look at documentation. And we have this in for create system, which we have this CPU target also. And uh, uh, that's in the advanced keyword argument. By default, it's going to use the same one as Julia itself uses when it, uh, uh, the Julia you download, it's going to use the same Julia CPU target, but you can override that. So if I go into the source code, I can just actually show you. Here are the, diff the default CPU targets when you do apps. So right now, it depends which architecture you're on. It's going to give you different ones. This is the default that Julia itself uses, but you can also specify this uh, yourself. Uh, question here, what happens if the libLLVM isn't there and a copad isn't compiled in the sys image? 
Well, you would need to compile all code paths then somehow. And with the, I said this with the compile all flag here, you can, it's sort of a way to compile generic versions of, of all the code you have. So there's always like a generic fallback to do, but uh, this, this is not integrated yet. So this is more a future work idea. Mm, here's a question. If I distribute the binaries uh, created by static compilation duty, how do you assess the risk? that someone do reverse engineering and extract the code from binaries. Let's say zero for C, practically impossible, and T for Java, quite easy. So that is a, a good question. Uh, with C, uh, what you get then is, of course, you can always read the assembly, and there are disassemblers that can that are pretty good at piecing back together the disassembly into source code. So I wouldn't say that it's practically impossible to reverse engineer C, but uh, sure, it, it's, it's hard. For Julia, you do in the, um, in the sys image, you're not going to have uh, the source code, but you are going to have something called lowered code. So if you go, if I start, um, if I start sys, I can just start Julia with uh, this sys image that was bundled with the uh, with the app, and now I can. Uh, let's see here. I can actually do code load here. So while this is not a source code, it is a, a version, a lowered version of the source code, which you can still, there's still uh, variable names there and so on. So this is not a way to sort of uh, super uh, defend. If you, if you have a, like a secret algorithm or something, you can probably figure that out from reading here. So this is not a, a way to, harden uh, your code in a, in a very hard level. So if I'm gonna say from zero to 10, uh, I don't know, let's put it at five or six then, <laughs> if I'm gonna have to put a number on it. Um, question is, can you create a DLL or delete instead of an executable? Uh, yeah, DLL is kind of like just a sys image. And uh, there's a, it's a good, Actually, a good uh, example of this. Uh, uh, there's a, a guy called Simon Burney here, which has done a, an example uh, here called libcg, which is a convenient gradient for C and Julia. And it's uh, sort of a proof of, of concept of using one of these custom Julia sys image and calling it from C. So if you're interested in calling uh, Julia from C, uh, you can take a look at this repository and I think it's gonna go a pretty good start. So uh, if you look here, we have the normal Julia code and then it, uh, it exposes this C callable function that you can call from C. And then in the C code here, uh, it's gonna call into Let's see where it is. Here, it calls into the Julia code here with this custom system image. So this is a good uh, good starting point if you're interested in that. Christopher, there was a there was a question at the twelve forty four minute uh, by Zach. Can you put any kind of Julia code in the precompile executable file? We kind of skipped over. Yeah. That. The Yes, there should be anything to go in there. It's going to execute, and the uh, um, the signatures that get compiled should be recorded. So that's um, example. If I compile it on x86, will it be specific for that architecture, which is something generic that I know will run on say, a server? Uh, so that's again, uh, this was a question. So that's again with the CPU target. By default, uh, it, it actually Julia compiles multiple versions of many of the functions. And then at runtime, it's going to pick the one that works best for your architecture. So that's why you can download the same Julia uh, on, uh, let's say if you have a new uh, processor, it's going to use newer instructions for some of the code. And then if you have an older one, so Julia has this capability of at uh, runtime choosing different uh, versions of functions. I think it's called the uh, function multi-versioning. Uh, is the term for it? 
Um, here's a question. Is the way to compile multiple compile, uh, command line apps at once so they can be shipped as a bundle that only once includes, yeah, with, uh, including the system mission libraries? And right now, uh, it is only one app for a package compiler, but I am pretty sure that I opened an issue about that. Uh, multiple executables in an app here. So uh, it's on the radar to do this, but, uh, and the way we can implement it is that you have sort of a list here. So there's there's two hearts right now. Maybe if there's even more hearts, it's gonna go faster. Um, and then someone asked if, um, post a link to the slide. Yeah, uh, very soon the slide is over and then the slides are over and there will be a link there. I will also post it in the chat. Um, so the time actually is 1852. So I think I'm gonna skip, I'm gonna do this relocatability pretty quick. So one question is if you can use all, uh, all your normal Julia packages in one of these apps. Well, since you're gonna send it to another machine, then they have to be, uh, these packages have to be what I call relocatable. And that means that they can't really embed too many assumptions about the machine that the code gets compiled on, because then when you run it on another machine, those assumptions are gonna be wrong. So uh, one example that some packages do right now is that they have this kind of a build stage where uh, the build stage runs uh, before the, just the, after the package has been installed by the package manager. And what it could do then is it could try to find this library on the computer uh, by an absolute path. And then it could write out this absolute path to a file. And then when the package itself gets pre-compiled, it includes this file. And it, uh, when the package runs, it sort of opens it. Problem now is that this is an absolute path. So if you send this to another machine, uh, it's not gonna work. So that would be one case where you wouldn't be able to use this package uh, as an app. But uh, there's this uh, new thing since Julia, or new thing is since one, Julia 1 Julia 1.3, which is called the artifact system, which is a more declarative way of, of specifying dependencies uh, on, on libraries. Uh, and uh, actually there's a repository here in Julia packaging called Yggdrasil, which is sort of the, the, tr the tree of everything. So here uh, are all the, the, the different libraries that can be used uh, from Julia you know, using this artifact system. So if I go over M, we have MKL, Metis, and a bunch of mumps, a bunch of these popular ones. So if you if you use these uh, artifacts and these JLL packages, which they're also called, uh, then you're you're good to go. But since no source files exist during the runtime of apps, if you have a package that try to use one of these source files during the runtime, it will not work properly. But more and more packages are moving over to this artifact system. So you know, more and more of the ecosystem is available for this. So if we again take a little tally of the Julia app uh, functionality, then is this possible to distribute apps that are made in Julia packages that are just run? So you can just send it and, and uh, run it. And these apps have kind of a low latency thanks to the custom system image and the pre compiled script. However, there's no cross compilation that's possible right now because Julia itself doesn't cross compile. And the size overhead is a bit too big now for like small apps. Uh, I showed you before that the, a lot of the libraries are bundled and it's a bit, it's a bit big. And uh, if you have this interactive package, the pre-compile script can be a little bit hard to make because uh, you're gonna have to start the recording and then you're gonna have to uh, click through the interactive uh, functionality to do this recording. And if you want to automate that, that could be a bit uh, difficult. Uh, I put a, a few useful links here. You can take a screenshot or you can uh, look at the slide later. I'm going to show the link to the slide uh, next, next slide. But uh, we have the documentation for package compiler, the blog post for artifacts, uh, the Julia embedding docs is also, if you're interested in this, it's good reading. It's a little bit more advanced, but it's useful. And if you're interested about latency and pre-compilation, uh, Tim Holy has written a few recent blog posts uh, detailing a lot of these stuff, which are, are very good to, to read to get a bit more, uh, more background on that. Um, 
So that was all my slides. Thank you very much for listening to me. The URL is here. Just so you guys have it in the chat, I also copy it. Okay, it should be in the chat now. And let's see if there's any more questions. Um, if I compile, let's say, a web app in my local machine, which is Unix, then I upload it to a server, which is Linux, how may, will I make it work? For example, in Go, there is a flag to tell the compiler that for which operating system it should compile. Well, as I said, there's no cross compilation now. For example, Go has very good cross compilation. You can just set a flag to say where it is. So you're going to have to compile on an operating system, which is the same as what you're, you are going to uh, run it on right now. Awesome. Well, th thank you very much, Christopher. That was awesome. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Please do reach out to us uh, via the Julia discourse. Or if you're working on a production model, please inquire by emailing sales at juliacomputing.com. We'd be more than happy to, to take your inquiry and see how we can help you out. Um, thanks again, Christopher, and hope everyone has an excellent weekend. Thank you very much.